Hey, I'm a roof framing contractor and my worst fear is coming out on a job and it being out of level and out of, you know, square and so forth. Because we do full hip roofs that are designed to land on square corners and, and that means inside and outside corners. If they don't, it doesn't work well if we pre-cut the whole thing. <clears throat> and of course, we get a lot of blame for it. It's, it's operator, you know, it's our problem, but in fact, it's actually uh, the system of plumbing line and they're using, <clears throat> or they didn't just did snap square. Sometimes carpenters will just snap three, four, five squares instead of over and over and over again, and it builds up and their, ac their accuracy fails, you know, instead of running two lines perpendicular to each other. Everything going north-south pulls off one without adding up dimensions, just pulling off and over and over. And same with west-east, and it's a bit of a pain in the ass. You need two people to obviously snap a plate at least, you know, or snap, and snap at least, because you got to go back to the original line over and over, instead of just going from like the bathroom to the closet, from the closet to the living room to the living room. You go all the way back each time create your dimension and pull all the way back and pull all the way back. As a framing contractor for 25 years now, 24 years now, um, I hate getting the situations where the rafters or the joists don't line up with the walls. And We've been through that. We don't want any of that. And, uh, but as a roof framer, it's really important. And concrete too. So let's talk about polygons for a second. That's what I want to go over here. Get a lot of houses that have a little this is a hexagon, hexagon pop-outs on the outside for these little hexagon, which are technically called orioles, oriole roofs, but we call them octagonal pop-outs or polygon pop-outs. Now they can just come off the face of the wall or they can be all the way up onto the roof, but there has to be some kind of a concrete. Sometimes they can cantilever off of the building, so there is no foundation, uh, but a lot of times there's a, there's a foundation. And as a framing contractor, I was also a union Carpenter, concrete, and non-union, more non-union concrete than, in, than union concrete. Uh, because we would bid jobs and we would take what, you know, if they were delayed, we could just knock out their concrete. concrete. And also, we, we lay home, we set our, all our stab anchors and everything like that. In California, there's a lot of that, you know. We might as well, we have to pull square on their forms anyway, so. Pour our own concrete. Not so much for custom homes and hillside homes and things like that, just like additions, you know, out and up kind of thing, but have done and will do. But anyway, polygons and concrete. Now let's look at this. This is a hexagonal pop-out, concrete pop-out. Let's say that the rest of the foundation is running this way and then it'll dog leg, 60 degree angle pop-out these dimensions vary. Sometimes it'll come out a little bit further than this. Sometimes even less than this of so the legs on either side will be, the returns will be less than the front end. Sometimes it'll be, there'll be more than the front end and they'll have a little ridge or whatever. So I drew this to show you that hexagons are created from equilateral triangles, which are triangles, which are always 60 degree triangles. You know, 60 degree triangles can be found in nature. Beehives, you know, and so forth. All three legs are the same length and all three angles, right? And what we know about <clears throat> triangles is all three sides add up to 180 degrees. So that means that these are automatically 60 degree angles, three 60 degree angles. And <clears throat> Hexagons and octagons are neat in that you can find them organically. You don't need math. Right now we're going to talk about hexagons only, which are six-sided. And we're going to go from here to here to here. And starting out with a circle now. Let's say you want to pour this concrete. You're not quite sure how to form this, you know. Um, you got a sense about it. You know this angle, but angles can throw you off, you know, one degree or two degrees can really throw you off. Um, you could cut a piece of plywood where all three sides are the same and this would be 
the front, you know, and lay it down on, and form like that and form like that, you know, straight off of your footing if you pour your stem wall and your footing separately. There's a lot of ways to do a business, but let's just talk about plating existing concrete when you come on, come the framer, when you come on, but not until we talk about how to get it. So you're given this front end length and you want to know, and let's say it's four feet. Let's just say it's four feet. You'll notice that that'll mean that this will be eight feet. When I say this, I mean the center line. It's going to be eight feet because this in reverse would be a, a six-sided figure. So if you had two of these. So what that means is that if you have one of the legs at four feet, then two of the legs will be eight feet and you'll create an eight-foot circle. In the middle will be four feet, you know, right? Divided in half. You have a radius point already because you had to pull your, I mean, the radius of four feet, you had to pull your eight foot circle. But at that point, you can, can run a line through pretty much anywhere you want, you know, as long as you go through that line, you're going to be bisecting that thing, right? And then you pull from the side to the center, which is four feet, remember. And swing an arc. In doing so, you'll create a leg that's four feet by four feet by four feet. It stands the reason, right, that you just swing an arc because all four, all three of the legs are the same. If this is four feet, then that's four feet. So you just bang into it, make a mark, a circle. Once you make a mark, then you don't need to keep on doing it. You can just go around the circle four feet, four feet four feet, four feet, making these marks and connecting them. And you're making six of these equilateral triangles, four foot legs, and 60 degree angles, right? To snap concrete, first thing you would do would be to establish this front one based on these two side four foot legs. It's gonna be difficult. So you'll pull eight feet from side to side. So it jogs, kicks out, comes back and it's, let's say it's out. Concrete is often out, you know. It's from order from chaos, you know, starting at the soil, getting a little bit more accurate, to even more accurate, you know, and then the finished work is even more accurate, right? Our framing has got to be really accurate though to roof frame. So you put the concrete kicks out, let's say, say it kicks out and, and it only leaves you seven foot 11. You're going to have to hang the plates a half inch on either side. You decide what you want to do, maybe the center line when you square back off of it, or I should say square forward off of it, because you don't even know if this is parallel. When you square forward off of it, you, maybe it's not centered here and you want to center it here, so you move it over and hang this side a half inch, I don't know. We do hang plates in order to, <clears throat> remember the plans are contract documents. You're supposed to build as per plan. If you don't build as per plan, then it's a breach of contract and they don't have to pay you. If they come around and the room is not what they said the room was supposed to be and they have reasons for it that the framers don't know or something, we can't change it. We can't shrink the room down three inches just because the concrete's three inches less. If we hang our plates an inch and a half, all the hold downs will be on the wrong place if you live in California and there's hold downs unless the framer came out and made sure that it was right to begin with, and that's why we're here. So anyway, you've got to build as per plan, even though the excavators and the concrete contractors didn't before you. It's up to you to bring it back to the, to the norm. And if you cannot do that, you have to send you know, an RFI. You have to give them the information. That's a request for information. To the, the general contractor, if you're a framing contractor, will then turn around send it to the, the, the uh, architect or engineer. They'll send back an SK, a ske sketch of what they want you to do. Sometimes it's just written out and then the general contractor will put a price on it. <laughs> You'll put a price on it and then together they'll send it out and see if it's signed off before we you can even do anything. Sometimes I would just fix things. And then as I became more advanced of a contractor, framing contractor, my 
the general contractor would say, hey man, you can't fix everything. I need to get paid for their mistakes. And also we push back on the architect and homeowner for maybe hiring an inexpensive architect. We push back on them to do the right thing because we're gonna be hitting them and hitting them and it's gonna cost the homeowner hire the architect for a certain price and now the archi we're ha we ha there's all these change orders based on a bad design that's going back to the homeowner who's saying, man, listen to the architect. You need to do it correct the first time or, you know, I don't know what, you know, but you, you, we signed a contract that says you're gonna do it for this amount of money or you did do it for that amount of money and I paid you. We can't go through this over and over. We can't have the, the job. Traditionally, architects would drive the cost of the, the job. This is an old thing, but the, a homeowner would come up with some amount of money, you know, say, I have this much to build a house, and the architect would make it work because they had, early, early on, they were subcontractors. Later on, they became, or that is to say, they ran the subcontractors. Uh, they took a percentage of all of them the subcontractors and so forth in order to make, to pay their wages to make sure they did the right thing. Uh, now, this isn't necessarily across the board, but this still happens. But point being is they drive the price. They're supposed to be within budget. Right? So anyway, I'm digressing. But so you snap this thing out, you find center net line, pull parallel, snap it, and then what are you gonna do about this one? How are you gonna get this one, right? This leg, that's gonna be what, 120 degree angle, is in that right? A dog leg of 60 plus 60 is 120. How do you get 120? You gotta find this diagonal right here. You can, you can do the math if you want to. You can divide this in half and make it 30 degrees and go 30 tangent on your calculator and it'll give you this leg length right 30 tangent and it'll give you a ratio of this leg length this is not trigonometrical terms because i'm talking to carpenters this from here to here based on the new angle and you could just draw a uh, market here and find out what it is you know and then once you do so you can measure once twice right and that will be it so then you pull your Take from here and make a mark there. And then from there you would add this twice. That'd be eight feet to get this one snap back and snap back. Now all three sides are gonna be the same. And if you were to pull a tape from the outside corners to the center, they would all be the same and that would be correct. Now, we talked about plumb level, square and true. In architecture, the term true means true length. But when we, as builders, talk about true, we're talking about as per plan. So plumb level square and also as per plan. If it calls out four feet, we want it to be four feet. Enough said. But anyway, this is the method by which you can get a uh, hexagon. Equilateral triangle, equilateral. All three are the same length, all angles are the same. Three of those make half of a hexagon. Hmm?